All right, guys, welcome back. This next meeting is September 18, 2013. And once again, we'll be doing roll call first. I'll ask you to please remain silent during roll call. And with that, Mr. Hobiak, please read the roll call. Hillary Costa? Here. Ryan Bedford? Here. Caitlin Berg? Present. Tyler Dean? Here. Robert Santuri? Here. Melissa Chino? Here. Rebecca Allen? Here. Philip Roder? Here. Phil Meyer DeLomba? Here. Magalie Etienne? Here. Ashley Goldberg? Here. Jonathan Kamisiak? All day. Rachel Lee Allen? <coughs> here. Nicholas Rose? Here. Anka Tolich? Here. Gary Penfield? Scott Kane? Here. Namita Sarawagi? Here. Mark Gunning? Mark Kalucci? Here. Aaron Buckley? Present. Okay, guys, about the rise of the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, but after the Pledge of Allegiance, please remain standing for a moment of silence for the David Yashu. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
part of the time and then uh, lived on campus. But I think the biggest thing for me was Rick was pretty life changing in many ways. I think the um, you know advice I'll, I'll, I'll say is after you graduate, if you had a great experience, stay connected with the college. I have for many years. Um, I serve in the alumni board, um, so I'm doing a lot of work in the background as an alum to make sure that um, you know we have great relationships with our young alumni, which we need to work on. Um, we need to continue to work on that. Um, but we need many of you to stay engaged. Most of the Rick grads end up living in this state. They become leaders and servants here in this state. And it's so important that you stay involved with Rick so that you make sure that Rhode Island College continues to be at stronger and stronger or as strong um, as it was for you when you were here. So um, fast forward. <laughs> um, what's interesting is my, my time on student parliament was not what um, uh, it kind of lit the fire for me to want to be involved in public service. I went through a program called College Leadership Rhode Island. I don't know if many of you are familiar. Um, it's a, a, a four-month program that they offer college students here in Rhode Island. I had the opportunity to um, go up to the State House for the day, and we actually were um, pretending that we were state senators, and we actually debated on a, on a real bill. At the time, it was uh, smoking in public places was the bill that we were uh, pretending to debate. And I was just so moved um, at the fact that, you know, I wasn't as familiar. You know, again, I was a Rick student. I knew how local government kind of worked. I knew how we did things here at Student, student Parliament. But I didn't really realize how laws were made in the state at the time. I didn't have as much exposure. But it's everyday citizens like you and I, you know, are elected to make laws from, you know, wearing seatbelts to gay marriage, you know, gay marriage to, um, you know, m m small issues and big issues. And I realized just how powerful it was um, to, to be a public servant. And I was also discouraged at the fact that um, our General Assembly here in Rhode Island, the people making the laws for us, are not diverse. They're not really representative of who we are as a population in Rhode Island. There's one Hispanic senator in all of, in, in the entire state, and we have the largest Hispanic population in Rhode Island. So again, that's a huge disparity. Um, the number of women serving in local government is, is uh, local government, state government, and nationally is, is uh, it's getting better, but you know, there, there obviously there's room, um, the gay or lesbian individuals who are serving to young, young people. So again, it's, it's having a diverse governing body that's going to make these laws. You know, how can you have, um, a body of people making laws about women's reproductive rights or, um, or or rights for gay and lesbian people if you don't have any women serving or you know gay and lesbian people serving or people of color. So I think I was more struck by the um, by the lack of diversity sort of. Um, so over over time, um, you know, running for office wasn't something that I thought of. I worked on campaigns. Um, both locally for Lieutenant Governor Roberts and some state reps, and then I also uh, worked on Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. And I think that's um, the moment in time where you know I, I um, was really excited about uh, becoming a candidate myself. Um, so you know I think you know a few years passed, and um, I became a homeowner in Smithfield, right? And I didn't grow up in Smithfield. I grew up in East Providence, which is a very diverse community. Um, very liberal kind of um, city, and I moved to a, a pretty conservative town that wasn't very diverse with my husband, and I thought it would be pretty difficult actually to get elected in a town like that, you know, how would they ever elect a young person like me who just moved in, um, who may not have the same ideals as some of the people that live in my town, but um, what I first did was join a, a, a board, the Affordable Housing Advisory Board in my town, and I know you guys are still college students, but um, after you graduate, there are so many community boards that need um, young, young people to serve on them. And in, uh, just in your cities and towns, I don't know if you're familiar, there are so many governing boards that are just in your cities and towns where you live. You know, the, the water and sewer board, some boring things. Um, but there are all of these boards that community people serve on to make sure that the things in your city or town where you live, um, how many of you plan to stay in Rhode Island and live in Rhode Island after graduation? Don't see too many hands, but no matter where you go, Massachusetts, California, you know, there, there are citizens that serve on all of these governing boards in this town. So I started out there and wanted to kind of, you know, get my feet on the ground. And what was interesting was Smithfield was pretty opposed to affordable housing because, again, they're a very conservative community. We have mostly senior citizen population. And I was concerned that we didn't have enough affordable housing for families. Um, so I, I served for a few years on that board. 
Um, and then the right time came along. I think you have to decide when the right time is for you. And I ran, uh, I ran for town council, which is like city council here in Providence. I have um, 23,000 residents in my community. Um, I knocked on about 5,000 doors. Um, so that was uh, really interesting to go from volunteering on a campaign to actually being the candidate yourself. Um, and I think the message I want to share with you is, and I was told this um, when I was thinking about running, never let the fear of not knowing enough hold you back from, from anything, really, from any of your goals, but especially for wanting to become a leader in the community or a public servant. You'll never know everything. In fact, turn on capital TV at any time, right? And you'll see again that the individuals who are leading our state here in Rhode Island, uh, many of them are wonderful and have been serving for a number of years, but some of them uh, I find not as articulate as they should be, not as passionate, they're not doing their homework about the bills. So it, I'm not saying that anyone can run for office, but anyone can run for office. And I think that, <laughs> but I think that my point is, is don't let the fear of not knowing enough hold you back. You'll never know enough. In fact, when I campaigned, Actually, I didn't really know about a, a lot about my town when I was running for office, and I thought I was going to be asked all these hard questions. I ran this past year, and I was elected this past November, um, and I was actually disappointed at the lack of knowledge that the residents of Smithfield had about what was going on in Smithfield, and they actually didn't ask me any hard questions. So I prepared to talk about pension. I was prepared to talk about pension reform and. Um, you know, all sorts of things that were maybe affecting them, and nobody asked me hard questions. They asked me why I was running, how old I was, you know. Um, so it, it kind of made me sad. Um, so again, the majority of individuals living in any given community um, are busy, and they don't really take the time to get involved. But I think what was exciting for me was I got to meet around 5,000 people that live in my community. Um, you know, how many of you even know your neighbors that live on your street? You know, you don't really see each other until you're out shoveling the driveways or you're having a yard sale in the summer. But I got to meet 5,000 people that lived in the town of Smithfield, blue collar workers to, you know, business owners to. And it was so exciting to me, not just, you know, about getting to know Smithfield, but getting to know the people that live there. And then I started to get so excited about serving my community. Um, so anyway, long story short, I ended up being the highest vote getter out of 10 individuals who ran for town council in Smithfield. Um, and I'm, um, I'm there, it's a five member council. There are two Democrats and three Republicans. I'm a Democrat. So I was elected in the minority, um, and I was a minority in many ways, a young woman, uh, kind of liberal minded, who ran in a very conservative town. So I just want to say it goes to show you knocking on doors, hard work, getting to know the people that live in your community. If you're interested in running or working for a candidate is really what's important. People want to know that you care and that you're connecting with them. Um, and I can't tell you how many thousands of people have said to me no one had knocked on their door in 10 or 15 years. So we continue to reelect the same individuals on the local and state level and no one really goes to talk with them. So flash forward, I've been on the council for 10 months. Um, it's very different um, than I had expected. Um, it's been an incredible experience, um, a learn, big learning curve. Um, on the local level, you have to know things from zoning to planning to environmental. You know, we have a lot of um, waterways and bridges in Smithfield and open land and space. And so you have to, you really kind of, um, you, you, I tried to prepare myself, but you don't learn until you're on the job. So it, it's a learning process. I've, I've, greatly enjoyed it, but I think the biggest thing, and I'll give you a quick example, was people just want to be communicated with. Um, we had a big, we always have big snowstorms in the winter, but we had a very big blizzard right this past winter. Um, I'm not a mayor, so I was an ally with the DPW trucks, although I wanted to be, they didn't let me. Um, so just, a, I'm sitting in my pajamas at home, no joke, drinking hot chocolate during the snowstorm, and all I did was, I have a Twitter page, a Facebook page, and a website. I'm the only council member who has any of that. <laughs> because they're all, they're all over 55, I'm just saying, they're all over 55 or 60, which is not old, they're just not interested, I guess, in technology, I'm not sure why. Um, um, and I was basically just communicating with the residents of Smithfield, all the updates that I was getting as a council person, you know, we've cleared this many roads, you know, national grid is out, putting electric on, and you know, and then I, I got phone calls the next week that said that was the most that anyone had ever communicated with them in, in any storm. And again, I was in my pajamas sitting in my home. So I think, you know, again, it, that kind of spoke to me, just communicating as a leader or a, a you know, a, a person who's leading government, communicating with people, being present, 
Um, you know, and this is a lesson I, I kind of want to share with you guys. I know many of you are probably over involved here in our room. So I was one of those student leaders who was involved in everything. Once I got involved with one thing, I sort of got involved with something else, and it's easy to get sort of overwhelmed. Um, as you advance in your careers and when you leave college, it's going to happen even more to you. And you have to really figure out what your priorities are and you have to learn how to say no. Um, otherwise, you're going to burn yourself out and not be good at anything. So I was sort of down on myself when I was first elected. There's so many events I'm invited to on a weekly, daily basis. Girl Scouts, you know, to um, all of the, you know, as a public official, I'm invited to a great deal of events in Smithfield. And I try to go to everything in the first two or three months. And you just, you just can't. You, you can't possibly go to everything. So you have to know that um, you have to be okay with being, you know, doing what you can and being where you can be. Um, and again, most of my fellow council people are just going to the meetings and then going home. They're actually not out in the community at all, which is very sad. So um, it goes to show you that we need more, um, more people to run, I think, for local government, um, to work on campaigns and support people who are running. Um, it, you know, in local government. And if you're not interested in working with candidates or running for office, that's great. What I wanted to say is, and I'm sure many of you are doing this now, um, and you can do this as college students, find groups of students and friends and people that have the same interests and passions as you. You want to align yourself, you guys, and be very strategic about who you associate with and what your, your path is for yourself. So if you're interested in affordable housing, start now, right? Start joining groups, start finding students that are interested in affordable housing, start looking at possible jobs, going on informational interviews with people who work in the community and afford, I'm using affordable housing as an example. It could be any number of um, um, you know, things that you'd like to do in the state. But start to really align yourself with people who have the same passions and think like you about particular issues um, because it, it, there really is strength in numbers and if you can become someone, whether you live here in Rhode Island or in Massachusetts or another state, who's an expert or someone who's seen, who has knowledge about that particular area, it's really going to take you very far and you're going to be really, really passionate about the work that you're doing. Um, I'm all over the place, but I also want to say, um, in terms of your careers, right, I don't know how many of you, what you guys are thinking of going into, but just know that it's, it is a tough economy to be a college student and college graduate and that your first job is not going to be your last job. I've had five, four jobs, full-time jobs, since I left RIT eight, nine years ago. Um, and, you know, I think you take a little bit, uh, you learn a little bit from each of those jobs, but just know you may not end up, ultimately, your first job is not, it may not be where you want to be. And I think it's important to know that your ultimate goal is to want to do something that you love. So um, it, it's going to be those experiences that are going to take you to that point. And if you're not fulfilled in a first or second job that you get, that's okay. You're going to learn from the bad experiences as well. But make sure that in your free time, you're volunteering and that you're getting your fulfillment out of your volunteer work and your public service work and all the work that you're going to be doing in the community. So again, hopefully, ultimately, you guys will get great jobs when you leave RIG. Um, there's a great network of RIG graduates here in the state um, and, and elsewhere. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Um, to ask for help, to go on informational interviews. I went on informational interviews all the time, and that really, really helped. Um, save the business card of any, I, and I, I was going to bring my business cards for you guys tonight, and I forgot, but Hillary can tell you how to get in touch with me. And I mean it, you can get in touch with me. I, I, when I was a, a senior at RIC, I bought one of those little binders from Staples. It's a business card holder binder. And I would, when I went on informational interviews or when I was at events on campus or off campus where there were speakers, I would save the business cards of people. And I really kept it. And you never know when you're going to you know, bump into someone or need someone. But, so don't be afraid to reach out. There are a lot of RIC grads in the state who get really excited when young RIC grads call them and actually, because they think they're old and they're, you know, um, that you have something to offer them. Um, it, it's kind of a great thing. So for those of you who want to get the heck out of the state, I actually encourage you to think about staying in Rhode Island um, because it is a really special place with a very small network. Um, which will really help you, um, you know, I think, obtain jobs and, and that kind of thing. So I hope I covered a little, I mean, there's so much to say. I could sit here forever um, about, you know, I, I assume you're all student leaders already. You're here at this table. I commend you. There are many grads who have gone on to, uh, Congressman Langevin, I'm sure you know, was a student parliament mem member, former Senator B. Lanzi. I think Alan Fung was the mayor of Cranston, myself. I have further aspirations to run for higher office. 
Um, so if you're interested in running for office or any of those things, you know, again, we're all here in the state, but um, I'm sure you guys are going to do terrific things. Um, you know, and I'm just happy to be back. I'm a little intimidated, actually. I feel very old. You, you know, so I was like, this is, and I'm at, I'm, at, I'm at Rick. I'm not in the student union a lot, so um, things, things have changed quite a deal, quite a bit. So no, you touched upon exactly what I wanted you to touch upon, especially with the informational interviews. I myself went on one with an alum from 1985, Georgia Fortunato, who is the superintendent of Lincoln Public Schools. And when I went in her office, she was so giddy. She was like, oh my god, come here and sit down. And like, she was like, as you said, Rick grads love to talk to students. And she told, she, she gave me a whole bunch of contacts to talk to. And she was just really, really excited. Um, so I encourage you, what's the best email that students should contact? Sure, you? it's um, Alba, A-L-B-A, my last name, underscore, Suzy, S-U-Z-Y, at yahoo.com. Um, and, and, and I mean, seriously, if anybody is interested in running a, uh, or volunteering in a campaign, uh, I'll probably need help next year, but or actually interested in running themselves, it was the greatest experience, and it's been a wonderful experience, and I was very intimidated at first. I mean, you, you know, um, again, I'm managing a $63 million budget. I'm one of five council members. I never thought I would um, be doing something like this, but I'm really happy that I am. So, um, and I don't know if anybody has any quick questions, but I talk really fast. Uh, you mentioned you were part of Student Parliament, uh, Rick TV, now Anchor TV. Um, what was your favorite club on campus that you were part of? Mm. One that you felt like you My favorite club? It, because I'm asking, you, you don't have to say probably. It was Rick TV. It was Rick TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very different, though. That's very, very different from what it is today. We were real grassroots. Um, I mean, gosh, we like spray painted our own sets. <laughs> um, it, it, it was a really, really great experience. I enjoyed working in student activities as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was a great campus job. Yeah, it was, Thank you. It was a wonderful time. I just want to say, as a woman, it's awesome to see young women like doing these things because it kind of makes you feel like one day you can do this. I'm, I'm in actually in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and I run into the same problem with 50 and 60 year olds, and I'm on Twitter, and they don't know what a Twitter is, and you run into that problem of. But I can help you, and they just kind of right. look at you like you're free. So it's, it's nice to see that there are others. On the same token, there's a lot to learn from the people who, who um, from from individuals who are much older than we are. Um, there's there's so much to learn from them as well. But I think um, I mean there's no way around it. We're just we're just a technology driven society, and I mean, I'm just being honest. I can't tell you how, what that's done for um, the, my how I communicate with town residents in Smithfield. Um, so, any other questions? Well, thank All you right. for great. Thank much. You. Operations analysis. 
We reviewed the whole system. There's been many surveys, online surveys, onboard surveys, which I call the orange destination surveys. We looked at, we moved our system, I'll call it from, we moved away from need-based, where people need service, to a market base where we think we'll get the most riders. Some of that is driven by our funding. We haven't had any additional funding in five years. So we're, for, we're focusing more, where we'll get more money from people paying through the fare box in our industry. So we're abandoning more of the rural suburban areas and we're moving more urban. So that is the overall context of this. The people who live on, who work on Provenance Street are much less satisfied than people that take a, a 7.30, 8 o'clock bus coming here because there's no longer service on Provenance or Smithfield Avenue or a number of other areas around the state. This is the first step. Over the next year, we'll be implementing it on, on a total of 56 bus routes. Some bus routes will go away, others will be growing. Um, the 11.99 will be coming a, a rapid route, which is a completely different thing for us at Ripta. We're spending about $3 million doing that. Um, this route itself, the 92, we decided that the 26.92 were crossing Atwells Avenue and then the trolley line were crossing. So we invested one line. We decided to go with 20 minute service out here to Rick. Part of that is a commitment of your current president, Nancy Carullo, Gary Penfield, dealing with them over a number of years. Three, about three years ago I came up here, they wanted to move the bus stop away from Roberts Hall. We didn't like that. Students could wait inside and wait for the bus. She promised she would build a bus, get a bus shelter built. You have the best bus shelter in the state of Rhode Island by far. She, we said also that, you know, she wanted more bus service on students, wanted bus service, or she represented, do you want more bus service on Sundays and evenings? And my comeback was, well, give them half-price transit because I need more riders to make it worthwhile. She did. You found money in your budget, I think the student government budget, to make transit half-price up here. Ridership increased, so when we did our comprehensive operations analysis, we decided to make a big investment with RIP, 20-minute service many more hours, rather than three different routes coming in on hours. But that eliminated the 55 from coming here, and the 55 will not be coming back here. The 55 was about an hour and a half of what we call dead miles, coming from Fatima Hospital over here. That's wasted miles. It cost $106 an hour to run a bus. We're not gonna run a bus in a mile and a half on empty roads for no reason. So we opted that 20 minute service, Going later in the evening was better than keeping the, the 55 running on its, on its schedule. Plus it's overcrowded a lot going to PC. PC is making some structural changes where we're gonna go in and turn around on campus. So those, those pieces together added up to, let's make the 92 come out here. We thought, uh, we had hired a consultant that helped us, and our staff thought the 92 was gonna become an overcrowded line. And some of the trips are already. It probably will, in five years, will become an every 10 minute bus line. One of the more popular, better bus lines in our system, just because of the, the demographics along Atwells Avenue, having this as an anchor, Mount Pleasant as an anchor, and the fact that with the whole east side connected, we have Rick Brown and a lot of Johnson & Wales students housing in between Atwells Avenue, Fox Point, and a lot of Johnson & Wales students we know because they are on the, our bus program and they swipe their cards. So we have the, the geographic information from all that. We know exactly what they get on and uh, the place they get on from that. So we know we have a lot of Johnson Wales students. So right now we're at every 20 minutes and it's probably not going to increase until we get funded because we don't have enough money. We have added a few buses in the morning. We call them trippers because of the high school impact, 7.30ish. We've added two buses around the one that's scheduled. They don't show up on a timetable, but there's three buses within 15 minutes to try to deal with the overload. We have these 35 foot, the trolleys are 35 feet long. They're actually 37 and a half feet long, but they hold fewer people, but we cannot use a bigger bus on this bus line because of Fox Point. The turn at Brown and Wicked and Street is too tight for a 42 foot bus, so we can't make the turn, so we're not making, we have to stick with it's very possible that these buses we will pull in and take some of the seats out and turn the seats all to the perimeter of the bus. It's called peri perimeter seating versus stadium seating. Stadium is facing forward. That way we'll have more standees just to try to fill the buses more. Ripter probably in the next three to five years will stop buying articulated buses, the buses with the Accordion, the men in the middle. 
because our ridership was getting so heavy. Two years ago, we had a 10% ridership increase, which is unheard of in transit. Last year, our ridership was flat, but with Hurricane Sandy and the snowstorm, we had three days where we didn't run any service, and there were edge days that we had you know, no ride, very little ridership. So if you take that into account, we had about a 1% to 2% ridership gain last year. So far this year, from July to September, we're up 7%. We have 17 bus lines that are overloading every day with lots of people up on it. So we've invested on this area. Uh, we're not gonna, we, yeah, I'm, I'm limited where I can put buses right now. We're overloading going to URI at seven in the morning. Going from Providence to URI, going to URI on Saturday morning at seven, and then leaving URI at 8.05 coming back. College kids aren't supposed to get up in the morning. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing, but we're overloading on early Saturday morning to URI, which, you know, we've never done that. We've all had problems with URI, but never that early. So it's a problem we have in the system. Um, one of your questions was surveys. Yes. As I said we did an origin destination survey last fall. That's where people intercept you on the buses and hand handed you cards and asked they, those cards are where did you get on exactly, where do you get off exactly, where are you going, and a little bit of the good old demographic information. Why are you riding? Do you work, student? Those kind of questions. There was also a, um, a more of a satisfaction type survey, but this summer, from July, June and July, we ran an online satisfaction survey. The online technology doesn't work very good in transit. Only about 50% of our riders have access to a smartphone and a computer. That's to do with economics. So any surveys we have from that, we came out actually 70% satisfied. People said 70% of them said they were very happy, but they said it's a very limited, we had 672 responses, which was very high. We wanted 400, so we got a lot of responses, but we know we leave a lot of our writers out on that kind of survey. So I think I hit most of the questions that you that you sent me, but any uh, other questions, let's please? Let's see. First up, we have President Costco. Could you elaborate a little further on um, where your funding comes from? I got an email from someone with the Richter Riders Alliance saying that it's the result of the gas tax. Is that true? 25% of our funding comes from people paying fares. Okay. Um, about 20% of our funding comes from the federal govern government. We receive money to buy buses, capital expenditures, and we're allowed to turn some of it into operating. It's called preventative maintenance to do oil changes and stuff. We take as much as we possibly can. That amounts to 20% of our budget. We're about a $103 million agency, um, and the rest of it comes from the gas tax some form or fashion. There are other things when we buy, when we buy buses and stuff, uh, up to this point, people have voted for bond issues. There's a lot of other hard things, but if you, if you break it up, it's around 55, 60% from the gas tax. That was established probably five years ago is the last time it was changed. It's a very odd tax for us to be getting these days because higher mileage cars, people driving less with expensive, the gas yield, the how much money comes in per penny of gas, is going down about a million a year. So we're losing about a million a year in tax revenue to support us. So our budget's actually shrinking every year. And that's a result of some of the things we're doing. Yes. Um, as a follow-up, does RIPTA ever think, well, where would you ideally, where's an ideal place that you could get more funding? Like, have you guys thought about other channels to help yourselves? I mean, I mean, I know it's a tough, tough question, but... We've been doing this for over three decades. <laughs> yeah. We've been working on that for three decades. Yeah. Transit is funded by a wild array around the country. In Washington State, in Ohio, you have a five-year referendum. And you vote if you want to have a sales tax in your community for transit. In Washington, it's a gas tax. And if you're doing a good job, people vote to keep it, and if they're not, you vote and you shrink the system. But that creates a very odd thing. You depend on the bus, and all of a sudden the bus lines go away. There are a lot of, there's about 20% of the system around the country are on gas tax, some places are sales tax, some are millage on uh, mortgages, which you have a, a recession like 2007, suddenly there's no money. So there's a lot of different ways. It can be, uh, we've had a number of bills up the last few years to raise that the funds that go to pay for transportation, that the DMV, when you pay to get your license, when you pay for things at, at the registry. We, we very much push bills that would, that would go to transportation 
the governor decided that that would go to highway transportation and cut us out. They, he and the legislator cut us out. We were the ones, we with a, a strong environmental group, uh, Coalition for Transportation Choices, had developed that legislation, but the transit part of it got cut out. You would imagine that RIPPA would, would, you know, put money toward that and not, you know, highway transit, uh, the highway transit. A lot of it's the lobby. I mean, we, we've had this strong group, but it's very environmental focused. Don't miss, when I say 50% of our riders don't have iPhones, it's smartphones, they're poor. Mm -hmm. And very low income people are working two or three jobs. They don't go to public meetings, they don't vote, they don't call elected officials. So we have a lot of our constituency is, a, is silent. So it makes it very hard. Sometimes I feel like I'm up to the state house alone because nobody else speaks up. The environmental community has been very, very strong pushing for us. You know, on the highway has the engineering and the construction companies and the laboring unions and stuff, so they did a better job, I guess. Representative, you question? Uh, I have a couple questions, but I won't go crazy with questions. Um, first question I have for you is, have you ever thought of creating any type of forum where possible college students or possible people, since this mainly affects us, I think college students, um, can come and talk to you, anybody else in development, and even like brainstorm possible <laughs> ideas, and then you guys can check the feasibility of it, and we can actually try to, you know, create like something that may be more efficient for everybody. Um, we're always open to ideas. Transit is, you know, transit's been around a long time. There's a lot number of ways to do it, but it pretty much comes down the same. We're always open to ideas. We'll meet with anybody. We do a lot of meetings. We are a shrinking staff. So there are a few, I have a, I have a marketing department that works under me that's two people. A hundred million dollar budget with a two person marketing, that's not much. So, but we, uh, like uh, with our COA public meetings, we set up 12, we went to about 25, and then we have public hearings. So any organization that had questions, if you called, emailed us, Facebook does, Twitter does, we said we'll come and have a meeting with you. So, you know, we're open and we go to all the colleges except for New England Tech. They do not serve New England Tech. They build off the grid. We don't serve um, unless they pay for it. So we're, we're open, but you know, we haven't had any outreach. I'll, so, you know, I, I started at Rick as a college student, as an intern for Rick, and I have three college students who work for us now. One is a Rick student, Will Potter, who is blind. He's a student here, I think it's junior year here. So I've had students, I've had high school students. Will started as a senior project at North Kingston High School. I have another guy from that school, Mario Mercedes, who's now graduated from St. Peter's, but I had him for seven or eight years. So we do stay connected with the younger people. And you know, we, Will went over some of the, believe me, I know you have a concern. We, our last bus trip leaves before the last classes get out at 10 o'clock. You have one class that runs at just about 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock In January, we'll be running to 11. So we're hearing those things. So but we're open to new ideas. But at this point, we've done, you know, honestly, the transit industry is very good at sharing ideas. So we know a lot of what other people are trying to do. So we'll be having, uh, so you know, next year, by, by this time next year, you'll be able to get real time information on your phone. Instead of schedule information, you'll be able to look on your phone and you can see the picture of the bus, where it is. And it'll tell you the minutes till when it's going to arrive. So we are going into some of those new things, but that cost ten million dollars. That took us eleven years to come up with that much money. And Senator Reid being on the right committee in Senate is how it happened. <laughs> um, I have one more question. The other question is that survey that you're talking about. Is there any chance that we can get a survey like that just for? I mean, it does limit your demographics, too, but just for this campus and try to get you know where this campus's minds at with, in regards to RIPTA and public transportation? Yeah, yeah, that would be fine, yeah. We could do another, you know, one of the survey Online monkeys survey or something, monkeys. Something, yeah, something like that, that'd be fine, yeah. And it's, yeah, probably the same one we already just did. It's a record focus on record. Okay. That's all I have. Representative Okay. Alumni representative, Aaron. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Um, actually, a lot of my, uh, all the other members of parliament have Aaron, you're the one who sent us about the class going to 10 o'clock, right? Yes. Okay. I was also... Blog, yes. Huh? I'm a blog fan. Yes. yes. <laughs> and um, while I was here as a student, I was uh, uh, 
a core part of the SDG's push to advocate for RIPTA here on campus. Bus shelter was a consequence of that, the funding for bus fare, et cetera. Um, I actually want to start my comments here with a, a couple of really strong positives. I remember thinking about the, the process of advocating for RIPTA on this campus and sort of communicating to students the options that were available, uh, advocating to the administration about it. Some of our big issues were having evening service. You, uh, you might recall besides the 55 line that ran no uh, service here in PC, the 26 line only it terminated I think at 7 p.m. and then there was no Sunday service and Saturday service was uh, kind of those little void for a little while until the late night uh, 55 line. So I, was, I just pulled up the schedule here. Now we have service all days of the week until uh, 10 and 10.20 p.m. Uh, weekdays and Saturdays, and that'll be becoming 11? Becoming 11. In the January. spring? Or in January? Awesome. <laughs> um, the 55 line, I hear you when you say that it's not coming back, that service is not coming back, but does RIPTA have any active conversations? You know, from the student perspective, there are certain pockets of the city that seem to, that we have seemed to gravitate toward, the PC area being one of them, where it's just recognized as sort of an area where affordable student housing is available. I know a number of, of RIC students and friends and recent grads and new students, I can probably count about 10 now, who are in a walking distance of that 55 line that can know that RIP is no longer an option for them to get to and from campus, unless they want to take it in and then from Kennedy Plaza and come out to the campus. Are there any long-term plans to maybe bring that other side of the North End into an active service model for Rick? No. And I'm gonna, from our perspective, it's about market-driven. We're, we're coming here every 20 minutes. The option is, is that we're running so frequently, you'll have to take another frequent line downtown. Okay. We're not going, we, we don't have enough money to be looking at the needs. We're very aware, as I said, I was here, it was, that was a, a resident area for Rick even then. But we can't, that would be over-serving the campus, even on the buses we would have. We'd have to go every 30 minutes or every 40 minutes on the 92 line to bring the resources over there. And so we're very much going into an era of focusing the resources on the main corridors. So it's easy. I mean, we're going to have a lot of them, the, the timetables are changing. If you look at the timetables, the, the ones on the roofs have changed. The ones that have a red slash, you know, run until 10 o'clock at night and every 20 minutes. So we're trying to make it easy for people to identify this is the frequent service network. But to do that, things like catching certain neighborhoods and certain areas, we know that the people do connect down there, but there's a greater need to come out here every 20 minutes than there is to connect that neighborhood. So that's the choice we're making. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and the big thing that I want to talk, to talk about, and I want to pull everyone else from Parliament in on this particular question is, since the Parliament uh, states its will through resolutions, it, it, it debates and it acts and it makes its voice known in a, a single document. What could this Parliament do to assist and better advocate for RIPTA to our own state representatives, to our administration who can then use their channels to lobby the state government? How can this Parliament continue to be an ally with RIPTA in advocating our own needs and, and bringing them in with us? I mean, watching our ridership when we have a uh, big thing in transit is the hours of service, how much you have on the street. Now that hasn't changed in about 11 years, we haven't had it an hour. And for our ridership games, I mean, 17% in two and a half years. It's unbelievable. People are, I call it, speaking with your bus, you're sitting on buses. But more likely, you're standing on buses because there aren't enough seats anymore. And I, I'm, I'm at a point where it's going to take you know, protest signs and do something about it. We have made all the arguments to the governor and the legislators, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah. And then come June, when they go into the big budget talks, we're dropped every year. Yeah. And, you know, um, Don Kacheri was never a big supporter of transit, but he funded his place. Lynn uh, Chafee was a big supporter, but now that he's there, he drops us. So I don't, and I don't know. So, it, you know, is it more of a general outcry? You know, college students in the state. Last year, we had over 2 million rides from college students. You know, and that's the ones, that's not counting this school where you paid with cash. That's counting ones that I have you on, I can actually tell, Brownstone, 
you know, Roger Williams, I can tell with those, exactly two million of those. So when you add up the others, it's probably three million rides last year. I might, I might speak from a, uh, a perspective of what, what I'm just going to term uh, common sense logic when it comes to the gas tax. Funny thing, if the gas tax is paid for by people going with their cars and purchasing gas, and that funds public transit, then logic, and this is not really a message for you or even for people here, it's through our state government, logic says that if less people are taking their cars and more people are going on the buses, that means you need more money to fund the bus system, but there's less money to do so. So sort of a, a rallying call to arms that this parliament might want to take up is finally getting it through the heads of the powers that be in the state that the gas tax is a fundamentally not flawed, not challenged, a fundamentally stupid and asinine <laughs> way of funding public transit. There's a, it's really actually quite indefensible at this point. Some people have missed uh, the change in younger people. There was a much higher percentage. I was of the era where environmentalism, there were people who were the greenies and they were thought of as strange and weird and now they're the leadership and some of them. People have, don't realize how what a, there's a high percentage of younger people college age who are very environmentally driven just in their everyday life. So taking the bus to get around, maybe not every trip, but taking the bus, thinking about it, and they don't realize that. I have a nephew that you know picked this college because it, in the environmental concerns, now we, you know, we, he works a job because he doesn't have to drive a car to get there. I, I think people in the legislature are missing that, that there's a, a whole generation coming that this is more important. I think of the legislature, they still think we're only the service of last resort for low income. We have an odd law in Rhode Island that anybody disabled or over 65 can ride the bus free. That's 25% of our riders. So when I say you paid 24% of our cost last year, another 25% of the people didn't pay a penny. So on average, a system our size gets a 20% fare box return. We're at 24%. 25% of our riders don't even pay. So $2 of fare and everything, we're actually pretty expensive and doing very well when so many people don't pay. The legislators will not introduce, they will not even think about changing that law. We try every year. And you can't even get introduced. So my thing is, we, we tell them that's worth $5 million. That cost us $5 million to move that population. We don't mind doing it, but give us $5 million. So that's one tack we're trying to take, is that you owe us $5 million to carry that group every year. And because it takes away from options or opportunities to do more for other people. Mr. Speaker, I think that this parliament might like to direct some of its energies at making its voice heard with some common sense solutions to how RIPTA can be better funded. And I conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Alumni yeah. Representative Buckley. That moves back to President Costa. Okay, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to yield the floor to one of the members of the gallery. Um, if you could just come forward so everyone can see you um, and state your name for us and then you can proceed. How are you? Um, I'm sorry, I'm still in here. Um, my, my question is super simple, like, you know, more logistically simple than that is seeing as you, uh, you as Brenda, cut the, the 26 and 55 in our survey. College students, not only at Brick, but also at JU and from Why isn't there any bus racks on the 90 We are looking into bike that. There's been bike racks. bike racks on the buses. The only bike buses in the system without bike racks are the trolley breakfast. And we do not have them because I work at an agency with most of the people are operations folks. They didn't go to college. 780 people and probably 700 of them are bus drivers from here. They think they can't take the turn of Wickedness Street to the bike rack. It's not adding too much distance to me. It's on the outside. We are running a test right now to prove if we can or not. If we can, we will be putting bike racks on the bus. Also, once you uh, do it, ordering them, probably be like February. We'll miss this semester. But we are, again, we're taking them on. So, you know, it's, it's an odd place, most of them. I've got Columbia graduates, I've got Brown graduates, MIT who work for me. But most of the people that work for us are high school graduates or GED folks. So, you know, we have this, we always have these doubts. We can't do it. They don't have, you know, I think we can. So that's a good question. Does that conclude?
swoop through Donovan and a lot of people I got to explain what the event was about or some people, oh, yep, I got to buy tickets and explain to them that the price does go up next week. So make sure you keep advertising for that. We have flyers galore, so come up to our office and Secretary Burke has them stored in her credenza, which by the way, is a shelf that's attached above the person's desk, for those of you who don't know what credenza is. Um, <laughs> Also next, um, Green Up Cleanup is this Saturday. Myself, Mr. Kamisiak, and Vice President Betancourt will be a team this weekend. Um, in the morning on Saturday, there will be a raffle for VIP passes to Roof Boston, so we're hoping that'll attract more students to attend. Um, also, another big announcement. I would like you all to please, 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 please make the effort to um, make arrangements to make sure that you're at the SEG um, reunion on October 5th at 11 a.m. It'll be held here in student, uh, Parliament Chambers, Student Union Room 307. Um, the invitations are already out. The, I'm working on the programming with Kate Rosina. Um, there will be uh, cookies and punch served, and um, it's a great opportunity. As Susie explained, some of the alumni that have come out of uh, Student Parliament are great business and community leaders, so I'm hoping that all of you please, please, please attend because alums love to talk to current students, especially if they're on um, student department. And finally, I just want to say a thank you to all of those who have been helping out Kate and Sharon with the Alumni Association and Homecoming Volunteers. Um, any of you in the room, raise your hand if you've been a part of Homecoming Help Out. Yeah, love you all. Very nice. Very cool. um, and that concludes my announcements. All right. We'll move on to Vice President Bancourt. President ATN has a question. Madam Madam, can you repeat the date and time for the reunion again? The reunion will be held at 11 a.m. in this room on October 5th. It's a Saturday. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. With that, we move on to Vice President. Vice President Brian Bancourt. Okay. Uh, just the first announcement. I just want to announce that declaration period has been extended for another week. Um, the original uh, date was supposed to be Yesterday at 3 p.m. the office closed September 18th. We've extended it until September 24th, until 3 p.m. Uh, the reason for that is to get a little bit more uh, participation in the class elections. Uh, and I'm just gonna read the open class election uh, positions once more. For the freshman class, we have president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and three class parliament representatives. For the sophomore class, we have vice president, secretary, and a class representative. And for the senior class, we have a class representative. So you have uh, until September 24th at 3 p.m. to sign up for that. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is I sent my elections committee an email. Uh, we're going to have a meeting soon just to discuss uh, uh, the upcoming elections, which is on September 25th. Uh, I just want to run down, uh, get a schedule going, and just uh, make sure that the elections run smoothly this year. Um, so just get back to me as soon as possible. That. Uh, the next thing I want to do is pass around the student activity uh, sign-up sheet again. Uh, it's the same sheet from last week that I passed around. I just wanted to make sure that everybody that signed up for their time positions were able to still make it. And if any new uh, people wanted to add names to the list, uh, because the more help, the better. Uh, so that's going to go around now. And the next thing I want to update you guys on is uh, our petitions. How many petitions we have in and out and what's going on with that. Currently, we have four petitions taken out. We have one in history, one in management, one in communications, and an at-large resident. And we also have one that's been completed that's waiting to be validated. Uh, that's a commuter petition, and I should be validating that tomorrow. So hopefully, we have a new face uh, coming to Parliament for October 2nd. September. Oh, uh, yeah, October 2nd. October 2nd. October 2nd. And, and we'll also have the, uh, the seats being filled for the class representatives. So we have possibly seven. Representatives that will be coming. Seven. Okay. And I just want to let everyone know that we just got the books in today, uh, so that's why we haven't been able to validate the one petition that's been hanging around. Uh, and that is it for my, for my announcements. Okay, thank you, Vice President Beck. Or that moves to Secretary Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, like Hillary mentioned, I did have my first roundtable meeting today, and it went a lot better than I anticipated with everything that was going on on campus today, including the president and treasurer meeting. Um, out of our clubs and organizations, I had 21 different clubs and orgs there, and I had probably about 26 or 27 actual people. Uh, I had to move in more chairs numerous times. I'm sorry, Mark. Um, but there were lots of people 
people and it was a lot more productive than I anticipated a lot of participation from the people there. They were talking amongst themselves and um, networking about their events and working on co-sponsorship stuff. So that's all the stuff that we like to see. Um, and in addition, per request, I know you guys got some stuff. I was asked to make a Facebook group for student orgs to better communicate the stuff that I email out or send letters about. So, or for them to communicate with each other to get in touch easier for co-sponsoring and stuff like that. Um, I just want to remind anyone who's listening or anyone who's part of a student org, these meetings are mandatory. They are taken into consideration by the Finance Commission come budget hearings. That is part of our policy. So anyone who was not in attendance today, I would, I will be emailing you um, to try and set up a meeting. And I would really appreciate you to put your best effort forward to get to a meeting with me. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that the last day to sign up for my cabinet position is tomorrow at 3 p.m. And interviews will be held tentatively sometime next week. So <coughs> that concludes my announcements. All right, thank you. Uh, so before we go on Treasurer Dean, I believe Representative Rose has a question. Well, um, I, I apologize, Madam Secretary, because I thought we had a talk meeting uh, today, and yeah, I was in me. I was in meeting with Ms. Salemi, and then uh, and I start I started looking around it. I was going to represent the chess club at the uh, roundtable meetings, but apparently I didn't even know anything about it. So <laughs> I, I on behalf of the club and President Dean, uh, I I would like to apologize for, uh, for that. We'll chit chat later, Nick. Okay. All right. All right. That that concludes my uh, remarks. Thank you, Representative Hose, and thank you, Secretary Burke. We now move on to Treasurer Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First thing I'd like to say, I still need three parliament seats for my finance commission, so um, even if it's none of you here, if you have a friend that is in the finance or business department, it's really a great experience to see how business works and do some real budgeting with real money instead of uh, just the theoretical things they get in class. It's real world experience, so that's a good way to get a parliament uh, representative to vote. Uh, like they said, I held my first uh, present treasurer meeting today, and I wanted to take a picture of this room because that's how I wanted to look during Parliament. Like, this place was completely stuffed. Uh, we had to, like, borrow five rows of chairs out of the ballroom, and that's what I like to see. And I'll use that as a segue. Me and Miss Allen are going to be speaking next week on uh, possible ways to increase student community government involvement and uh, possible ways to get more representatives here. Uh, we want to get some real ideas flowing instead of, you know, just just the base theories and stuff. We want some solid ideas to bring back to the Parliament and see what you guys think about it. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I can move on. Thank you, Treasurer Dean. Now it's on to my announcements. Uh, I have a couple leaves this evening. Uh, the first one is actually a retroactive leave from Faculty Representative Sanwagi. Uh, there's a previous century, and so I've got to send a request for leave for the last call meeting on Wednesday, 9-11. This is a veteran after request uh, to be confused due to, to a conflicting personal appointment at the same oh, time. Motion. All right, I have a motion from Representative Rowe to the leader. And I saw a second from Representative Tolich. Okay. <laughs> so is there any discussion on this leave? No discussion, we'll do a vote. All those in favor of approving the leave, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Uh, Representative Faculty, Representative Sog, Slugging, Things, sorry. And the passes. Okay, that takes care of all retroactive leaves. I have two leaves for this current meeting this evening. Uh, Speaker Santuri, Dr. Penfield, uh, Dr. Penfield is requesting a leave from tonight's meeting due to having a previous engagement. Motion. All right, Representative. Second. Motion from Representative Rose, second from Secretary Burr. <laughs> Sorry. I heard her. I heard her say it. That's the way to cook your troubles. Anyway. Any discussion on Dr. Penfield's leave? With no discussion, all those in favor of approving Dr. Penfield's leave, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Abstentions. <laughs> and Dr. Penfield's leave passes. And I also need a leave this evening for faculty representative Mark Gunning uh, due to a sudden family emergency. Do I have a motion? Motion. Okay. For a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this evening. Okay, I heard a motion from Representative Goldberg. And I heard a second from Representative Miali. So with that, any discussion on, sorry, any discussion on 
faculty representative of cutting his leave. All right. All those favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. Extensions and leave passes. Uh, I don't have any real announcements. I just want to talk about real quick. I'm sure some of you who know me on Facebook have saw my post today. Uh, when I came, to, I took the trip to, to campus this morning as Mark had requested I do so yesterday when I saw him. I took the night this morning at 10 o'clock. So I got to campus about 10.40, and when I arrived on campus, uh, I noticed that lot A was full. Now, and the only reason I mentioned this real quick is because historically, what we've been told as students is, you know, there's always some parking here on campus, but when I went to lot A this morning, there was no room, and there were cars circling lot A. Uh, I decided to take upon myself that a couple hours to go around to lot C, where the faculty and staff are, and that was 60% open. Uh, we went, and then I also counted the number of faculty and staff stickers in the student loop, and it was 18 and one resident student, which by the way, for any resident student watching, that is illegal. Because <laughs> uh, I've seen that twice now in the past two days. Uh, and the, my only thing I'm saying about this is because we have, we have ripped it this evening. I think that expanding RIPTA and helping RIPTA and helping advocate for it would be a great way going forward to help alleviate parking here on campus. But the other thing to keep in mind too is it's just, it's, it is a problem, hoping as the semester goes on, it subsides, but right now it is an issue, so I just want to point it out. If you, have any, if you have similar issues, please feel free to voice them out after meeting come to me. I'm always here. Talk to me. But with that, I think, uh, Professor, go back and question. Um, no, I just had a quick comment since you were talking about parking. Um, the campus police are telling people it's still okay to park in the res lot. Yeah, I also want to point out, uh, well, uh, for those who didn't hear, Dr. Goldberg was saying that campus police is still saying it's okay to park in the residential student lot, according to Dr. Goldberg. I will actually point out real quick the mock key. Which, which lot is it? The, uh, uh, I'm, I'm saying this as a resident, <coughs> not as a commuter. I'm saying as I'm not okay with it. Just, uh, a, just <laughs> a point of clarification, I actually got a uh, phone call from Chief Gio mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day asking me to communicate to students that uh, commuter parking is no longer allowed in L lot. So okay. I, I have to send out an email about that. Okay. Which I hopefully um, after this meeting. Thank you. Well, yeah, so then oh, oh, thank you, Dr. Paul. Okay. They're going to take me. <laughs> well, before we get to discussion about parking, because I didn't mind just cause that. No, yeah, let's but save it. Save for issues for all members, guys, just so you don't all online. But I will. I just wanted to point that out. So after saying, after to come to after me, talk to me, talk to Rep. Kibiziak. He is he is on the traffic and parking. And if you want to talk about this, please refrain from until open. Not until I go for uh, issue to public members. There's you do not see any guys online. So I know we Rep. Miali, Rep. Allen, Rep. Tolich, Rep. Uh, Vice President Bancourt. So you guys don't mind waiting until. Okay then. <laughs> I never want to cause a ruckus, but. I wasn't saying anything for uh, once. Uh, I had your list. Alright, so that with that being said then, that concludes my announcements. We'll move on to Deputy Speaker. Let's cheat Um, my only announcement again today is that I'm still looking to fill my With that, move to report. We have that's item seven, and we have uh, report number A, financial commission meetings of September 11th, 2013. Treasurer Dean. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to uh, request that these minutes be accepted from the Oh, okay. Right the oh, perhaps, uh, before we do that, I think perhaps uh, had a comment. Perhaps. Yes, if you look at the minutes to approve the agenda, it says motion by Mr. Gordon and second by Ms. Day to approve the agenda. Ms. Day is no longer on the Finance Commission. That it needs to be corrected to Ms. Goldberg. Would that be a friendly amendment? I hope, hope that that would be accepted as a friendly I believe amendment. It is. Yeah, I, me. I believe that is a friendly amendment. <laughs> so, as it's married. Thankfully, I read over the minutes. So, it's fine, guys. So, with that, is there any objections to the revised uh, Finance Commission minutes up to September 11th? No objection from me. No Thank you, President Rose. No other objections. The report passes. We go to report number B now. Number B. Letter B. It's been a long day, guys. All right. Letter B. Been here long. We're in here way too long today. I was counting spots today, for goodness sake. So, anyway, we have item B. 
I would say, Student Organizations Committee minutes of September 11th, 2013. Secretary. I just asked that uh, those minutes be sent to the unanimous consent. All right. Is there, <laughs> is, there any, is there objections to any objections? No. <laughs> okay, with that, report passes. Okay, now we're not done with reports. We now have report item C, campus security meeting, and I yield the floor now. Thank you, campus safety meeting. Can't read, but okay, right. Uh, I yield the floor, well, the floor goes to Representative Allen. Hey, everybody. So today, one of my office hours started. Hillary took me by the wrist, and we walked over to campus security. <laughs> kind of point that out. Um, so we talked with the deputy yeah. chief, and we talked about a few issues that are really kind of important, and I encourage you all to read my lovely little thing. Um, one of the big things was when you walk on campus, you actually have to pay attention to where you're walking, and you can't just step off of a curb and assume the car is going to stop. I, I know, <laughs> I know, but you can't. It's not, it's not funny, because if you read the report, oh. you know that a student did get hit at the hospital. Oh, so it's, it's important you actually watch where you're going. I, I know a lot of us with cars, we really try to stop, and sometimes we see that open parking spot, and we really want it, but you know, both sides need to just pay attention. Um, the one thing I think in the next issue is IT is the place where cameras decide to get put in or not, and it's not, it's strictly speaking, campus security. So that might be something we should look into is adding those cameras, um, talking to IT about that. Um, Hillary, do you want to talk about the brown uh, ID? Yeah, um, just to follow up on the IT thing, I know that Pamela Christman, I, I think that's a long-term goal of the department has in, in adding those. But anyway, um, the I was a, I was a, uh, I had an email sent to me by a student um, saying that there's a, 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 a program at Brown called Operation ID, it's a state-sponsored program, where it's kind of like a low-jack system for smart devices and um, laptops and computers and iPads. And what you do is you kind of you register it with the with campus police with a number, and then if it's stolen, um, that's a means of being able to track it down. So that's something that we brought to the attention of the deputy chief, and he's going to look into it, and we'll check back with him in about a week. And then the last is if you park illegally, you will be ticketed. And yes, parking is a nightmare, but if you park illegally, you're going to be ticketed. And the deputy chief pulled out a stack of tickets he has to do. And they're not RIC tickets. They're from the city of Providence. But you have to go in front of a judge and either plead guilty or not guilty. They can't just rip them up once they've written them. And it doesn't matter how bad parking is. If you park on the grass or you park in spaces you're not supposed to park in, you will be ticketed. And he really kind of impressed upon us that that's a big problem of people they're not if there parking. aren't two white lines on either side of your vehicle, Don't you're in an illegally parked space. And it says faculty and staff. Can't park there either. So, yeah. Okay. That concludes the report. That concludes All right. the report. Is there any uh, treasure D? Uh, yes. Like, the one very concerning thing about this report is that uh, Chief Gasparro said there's no reports on the break-ins. I saw two the first week of school. He said that he, they have not been brought in officer, and he, we looked in the files, and people who are getting broken into aren't making reports. They need to make reports. Right. Uh, they can't do anything if they're not being told this is happening. And another thing about Lot A that I really <coughs> wanted to try to push this year is to get fencing along the, um, the woods where you can cut through to the, uh, the building A building. But because like what I think is that that creates like an alleyway to escape after busting a window. If you notice, the windows are always busted right down the woods. So what I think is happening, my detective skills. woods, busting the window, stealing their stuff, and then going back through the woods and acting like nothing happened to my day because now they're all, all the way on the other side of the building. So I think if we put fencing there, that would limit uh, possible criminal escape and they'll have to go through the main road now. I will look so into that. Uh, deduction. Thank you, Treasurer <laughs> Detective Dean. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, is there any more discussion on this report? I presume, uh, Mr. Valen, you're going to be asking. Well, hold on. Uh, to make uh, 
prosecutor Santuri happy. Yes. I asked that there be a friendly amendment to put a space between the first two paragraphs. Is that accepted? <laughs> <laughs> I accept that friendly. Thank you, President right. Rose. Thank you for that, President Acosta. And with that, uh, you know what's consent? Yeah. Okay. We have, is there any objections to this report? Any no objections. Thank you, President Rose. And with that, and with that, we now move on to item 8 of the agenda this evening, new business. We have item A, not number A, uh, the Student Organization Policy Revision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If you guys, if I, I think everyone has an agenda, if you flip over to the flat, like just flip the agenda over, on the back page, um, these are the revisions that were passed through SOC last week. Um, they relate to the Student Organization Policy. Um, what existed, uh, or still exists, technically, um, under elections was just one line that pointed you to the elections policies and procedures. We added number two, which reads, an elections commission member must be president of site and receiving organizations elections for executive officers. We do that anyway. Um, I think it was removed. It was so, there, and then it was removed, and now we're bringing it back in. So now we're just put, I don't know why it was taken out, I don't. <coughs> I have no idea, but it was just being, it's literally word for word what was there, so we're just putting it back. Um, so I see why. Secretary Burke has have one question. Is yes. this going to be made effective immediately? It's, uh, yes, it's already it effective. Are, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just a point of reference. It, it's already in the elections committee. Oh. Um, it's not the elections commission policy. Okay. Just wanted to clarify for the policy. Yeah. It's not. No, it's not. That's why it's being. That's why it's here right now. Okay. Well, I know that we've been doing this because I served on the elections commission last yeah. year, yeah. and this was a practice that we that we had, and I guess it was taken out of the policy. So now I, I think I guess that would be up to your discretion. The only thing I can say is that we're probably see some elections commission policy revisions. So yeah, if it was there, I obviously wouldn't have asked. Yeah, for no, because I, I honestly thought that it was already in the election. I thought that this was just a point of reference to my. So with that, uh, Representative Rose had a... Um, I have a question. When it comes to voting, okay, since, I'm on, since I am on SOC, would, would I have to abstain from, from voting on this issue or yes. no? You, no. You already approved You yourself. already You voted yes. That's yeah, a, yeah I know, but I'm saying you know, that to when it comes to a full to a, to a parliament vote, would I have to abstain? Representative Rose, you have to abstain. There's no conflict of interest, yes. so you do not okay. have to abstain. You're all set, Representative Rose. All right. And with that, Representative... Um, I was wondering if one, we can just, you know, I would like to put forward a motion to accept this with unanimous consent, if we can, and if I can do that. And number two, if we could put in a uh, stipulation that it goes into effect immediately, because if we're already practicing it, it, why, why hold off on it? If it's being practiced, why not just put it in there? What he said. That's why I would like to put that forward. Or to make a motion to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion to accept the policy. Second. With the stipulation that goes into effect daily. Okay, so we have a motion from Representative Fiziak and second from Representative Roeder. And is there any discussion on making this resolution effective immediately? All those in favor? Discussion. Oh, side discussion. I just want to ask a comment that uh, in the next couple weeks I would like to provide the Elections Commission. Um, policy just to just to make sure that everything is uh, even and matches up. So I would like to state that as a representative that's going to be coming next week. Thank you, Vice President Blanco. Is any more discussion about this motion? Okay, all in favor of making this resolution effective immediately, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Exceptions and that motion passes. So now we go back to the main motion at hand, which is the provision still. Is there any more discussion on the provisions? Whether any more discussion? Mm -hmm. All right. So just so everyone's aware before we vote, it's the only not a vote right now because you only asked to be accepted with the answer. Was there? That was it. Oh, was a there was no motion or second for this, was it? It was just to ask that we have your parents' consent. Right. I didn't hear that. Okay. So with that, then. Yes, Mary. Do you have it in your recordings as some motion and second for this? Mr. Kamisiak originally said he'd like to make this as unanimous consent with the stipulation yeah. that goes into effect immediately. So Mr. Santuri had Mr. Brewer second Mr. Kamisiak. So essentially his motion 
would suffice as accepting it because yeah. it's accepting with the stipulation. So this is yes. all set. Yes, yeah, this is all set. I decided to have it Thank you, Mark. All right. Sorry. Sorry. With that, we can pass this resolution. So with that, we move on to updates from Mark. Dr. Kent is not here, and uh, faculty representative Gunning is not here. So we move to move on to faculty representative staff walking. No, no announcements needed? Okay. Move on to staff update. I'll pass because you want to be done at 835. <laughs> 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 Is that a second, Dr. Kane? No, Dr. Kane. Yes, Dr. Kane. Uh, for Mr. Pavlich, if he had an update on the number of ticket oh, sales for group right. price. This afternoon, it was a little over 150 ish. I just gave them the second batch of 200 tickets. Um, I probably would have a recommendation to the executive board. We're preparing and spending um, some money, believing that we're going to have about 2,000 students. Oh, I'm aware. And so we might want to reduce that uh, expense and maybe plan for 1,000 students. But we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. And then now, speaking of which, now we've gone to the Dean's Dudes update. That's okay. Just a couple and a half hours for each stuff. That's totally fine. There's yes. no <laughs> commuter parking at L lot anymore. Okay. So temporary provision. I'm going to get an email out about that with a bunch of different things. Also, um, I was asked by, I don't know, sort of the transportation people to uh, spread the word that uh, bike ra bikes need to be chained to bike racks and not block egresses of buildings and walkways and that sort of thing. They said they have tagged a number of bikes, put a note on bikes that have been sort of on staircases and hallways and that sort of stuff. Um, and now they're starting, uh, campus police is starting, or physical plan is starting to cut chains where people have sort of chained their bikes to places that are not bike racks. So if you know of anybody that has a bike, stick to the bike rack. Um, otherwise, it's going to get, the chain is going to get cut. I think they bring the bike over to campus police or physical plan. Somebody can pick it up there later, but Obviously, that's just a big hassle for everyone. Uh, parking, anybody uh, own a car and live in the city of Providence? Did anybody, did you happen to see my yes. message? And I, I, my office sends out the electronic newsletter this week at Rick, and there was a notice in, he goes out every Monday, there was a notice in this past Monday that the Providence, the city of Providence is extending its parking program, a permit parking program to students happen to see it so if you own a car and you live in the city of Providence and you want a, a permit to be able to park on the street it's now available you have to go through some procedures and pay some money right it's a hundred dollars for people who have an address based in Providence if you live in Providence and your address on your license is not Providence like my license still says West Warwick it would be two hundred dollars for me but I'm lucky enough to live in over two thousand rent <laughs> uh, but you can park, right? Yeah. Park it on the street. And, and actually, I think you're allowed to even get a guest parking permit. Maybe. I don't know. There was actually more. If you if you go to uh, the city of Providence and actually look at the specific regulations about that, there's more that I could get in that email notice that I sent. So there's lots of different options and stuff. So if you know people who are parking in the city or have a car, live in the city of Providence, need a parking permit, let them know that that is now available for college students. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that the, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the shuttle bus in the last couple of meetings. You know, the GPS thing that kind of show you where the bus is, that's still active um, as it was last year. So you can kind of, you know, look up uh, where the bus is at any particular time. I'm going to send out, again, more information about those, the specific website that you have to enter, the code that you have to enter to track that. But uh, I'll do that again here in the next couple of days. But just so everybody knows you, if you're taking the shuttle bus, not only can you, does it run every half hour, but you can literally find out where it is at any second in its route. Thank you, Dr. Kane. And with that, move to alumni representative, Aaron Pop. No, that's adjourned. No. Okay, then. We move on to item 10 of the agenda, appointment, resignations, and vacancies to Resident Costa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'll announce some vacancies in the Academic Affairs Committee. There is one more student parliament seat open and two non-student parliament seats. 
I'm by Lewis Education, there's a student parliament seat open, and on conditions and services, there are um, five student parliament seats and five non student parliament seats open. I might <laughs> fill a rotor to one of the student parliament seats. Anyone really quick here in Parliament, anyone want to join in a list on conditions and services? She needs people. She's not Fine. Right. Okay. <laughs> And anyone else, any other parliament members? It's about conditions services yeah, at the college. I'll join. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you owe me dinner, Alyssa. Anyone else? Conditions and services, not a very high commitment. It's just anyone else? Okay, I'm happy. So. Okay. All right. Um, to the Elections Commission, I appoint Jason Johnson to the first non student parliament seat. We have two, we have three student parliament seats open. Is there anyone else here on, on the board who would like to join the Elections Commission? No. Anyone? Going <laughs> once, going twice. Okay. The Finance Commission, as Treasurer Dean stated earlier, has three more student parliament seats open. Going once, going twice. Anyone? Um, and there's um, one more regular student parliament seat open for the Personnel Evaluation Committee. Going once, going twice. Miss Etienne is the other student parliament seat. And the Public Relations Committee has one, two, three, four, five, six student parliament seats open. You are on. You're appointed. Rebecca, I would like you to be on, please. All right. <laughs> Just put me on all of the committees. Hey, you were only on you were only on academic affairs prior to tonight, so. Okay, um, the Student Entertainment Committee has two student parliament seats open, an organizational seat open, and a residency seat open. The SOC Committee has two student parliament seats open. One of them, um, two, actually, nope, the two are open. Is there anyone else here who wants to be on SOC that isn't already? No. And there's three student parliament seats, th there were three student parliament seats open. I'm now appointing Doris Bermudez to the second non student parliament seat. There are now two open. And um, I'm just going to kind of go down the list here. I'm going to appoint Samantha Allen and Jared Serrating Ware to the two seats for Committee on, committee on Athletic and Intramural Recreational Policy. And um, let's see what else here. Caitlin Burke to the Performing and Fine Arts Commission Executive Council member seat. And Rebecca Allen to the second traffic and parking committee seat. Um, what? <laughs> okay, um, Caitlin Burke currently serves by herself on, as the student representative for academic advising. Is there anyone else who would like to serve on the academic advising board? Let's get these. Let's get us represented here on the academic integrity board. I need a student representative. Anyone here would like to make that commitment? No. You have um, other. Joining Parliament here. I know, so, I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, some of these people are only on one committee right now, so I wanted to open up the opportunity. Academic policies and procedures, um, academic standing committee, there are two seats open. Academic technology advisory committee. Anybody interested in there? Ryan. All right, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> There's one seat, um, and I almost did a sanitary. Du, 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 du. Um, student conduct board. There's a seat open. Anyone interested? Um, the student design course and concentration, concentration subcommittee. Anyone here interested? And committee on student life. I need a residency. <laughs> um, yeah, Ashley, go for it. You <laughs> 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 got this, girl. You got this. We didn't hold this thing. Thank you for your support, Representative Rose. Peer pressure is not okay. Guys. <laughs> you the Student Union Advisory Board. I need a student parliament member. Going, going, going. Two commuter seats and a club seat. Um, traffic parking is filled. Undergraduate admissions. That's a two year term. And Vision 2015. I need two students. This is the board that um, looks ahead to, at the college five years from now to see where they want to be in 2015. Um, once, twice. Okay. And thank you all for being such great sports. <laughs> Stop wearing your pen as an earring. That's just strange. Um, 
And that concludes appointments, resignations, and vacancies. I ask that these be accepted with unanimous consent. Uh, I would like to object to um, to, to, to represent Kamisiak's appointment to conditions and services. The reason being is because he did not fill out the committee appointment form for the conditions and services committee. So uh, therefore, uh, his uh, appointment should be invalid. The person can be appointed here if they've already filled out a committee application form, the information is already in, so that way when the Student Parliament Committee appointment sheet goes to our Administrative Assistant, Ms. Joan Barden, she can just add it to their seats. This is ridiculous. I was supposed to be notified about this. Would you like to be appointed to any other committees or commissions? Because you have the ability to do so. I'm going to I'm going to have to object to uh, Representative Roger's uh, appointment to conditions and services as well. He filled it out last week. He had it added to his committee appointment application form. Okay. You still have the right to object. I'm just telling you. Do you still? All right. I will. I okay. In that case, I will rescind uh, my objection. All right. Thank you, Representative Bose. Okay. With that, unanimous consent for these appointments. Unanimous consent. Unanimous consent and. Consent. All right, with that we will He say. still has his objection to Mr. Kamisi. Oh, he does? Yes. And he, he said he rescinded both. He said he rescinded Mr. Broders. You, did you rescind both? Um, yeah, I, I rescinded both. Okay. 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 So with that, we move to issue department members. Raise your cards. Hi, if you want to talk, please keep them high for Deputy Speaker Cheeto. Hi.
last bottle wedged underneath somebody's tire, so I kicked it out from underneath. So it'd be, it'd be really nice if we could have something so people, so people would go trash because it's disgusting back there. So if anybody wants to get on board with me with this, Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, too. Thank you, Representative Rose. Uh, does that conclude your remarks, Representative Rose? Yes. Okay, with that, with Representative Goldberg. Um, I just want to mention real quick, I mentioned last week the issue with the afternoon driver on the um, shuttle, but I took the shuttle again today, and I'm actually, I was doing an article with the ABC, I just wrote a whole group with the morning lady and chit-chatted, and they're working on getting um, the afternoon driver set in knowing that you need to stop at all the stops and they're working on making those changes. And also, we have a brand new shuttle. Mm -hmm. It smells like a new car. <laughs> <laughs> like, it is beautiful. There's a light that says Rhode Island College on the front and it's just really nice and I encourage everyone to give it a shot at some point. For information, that would be called a marquee. Oh, like. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> is that exclusion your mom? Yes. Minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> want to respond to Mr. Goldberg, but you just want to reach a cut for much later on. I tried to get him to put it down. I have something nice to say. Nice words. Nice words. Yeah, you can't respond, so... Yeah, that's my one of my own. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so, is that representing the Alice, please? I just want to, again, I don't want to cause a huge discussion or whatever. I know people can't respond, but I, going from being a resident on campus for three years and now living at home and having to commute, this place for parking stinks. That's all I'm gonna say. All right, thank you, Representative <laughs> Yali. That, Representative Rose. Oh, thank you. As I went into Donovan uh, today around, uh, maybe around 5.30, um, I was gonna get myself chicken times for dinner and when I got there, uh, there uh, remember I went there around like uh, during, like during the day of Donovan, right? They had the to go, right? The you know, chicken tires. They had they had none there at like five thirty. And uh, that that really concerns me because uh, and uh, and also um, and I have a I have a question for um, any of the executive council members here. Um, if if I were able to if I co sponsored a resolution, then right, then it passes. Would that count as one resolution being passed? Or would it have to, or would it I have to come up with my own resolution? And have I believe I would just I would just like to state that uh, not every parliament member does not have to put out one resolution for the year. Uh, it's strongly encouraged, but it's not mandatory. That was only a policy informed last year for the current year. Uh, that is that is no longer enforced, uh, but it's encouraged that we all come up with great ideas. And Which is why I'm meeting with all of you. I'm meeting with right. Milka. She she really didn't know what her big campaign was going to be, and I was like, well, what bothers you? And she said, the fact that there's trash everywhere in the back, I said, there you go. Uh, I would just like to, to keep stating that um, we are not in the nature of holding some of these uh, stipends, so we are not forcing anybody to propose resolutions, but we would like them to. <coughs> so just to clarify. All right, so what, what you guys are saying now is that yeah, if I call a sponsor a resolution, it passes that count that counts as one resolution for the past of the year. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. And that 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 concludes my issues. Information right. from information. The chicken tenders are in the line. You gotta wait in line. Mm. And that's what I saw. Them. That's where they're at for dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we move to the Dr. King. Um, the uh, college's official enrollment numbers will be out soon for the semester. I know that the um, incoming freshman class, the numbers that were admitted and accepted uh, and uh, you know wanted to come here are far exceeded the target uh, enrollment. So uh, I, I suspect the overall enrollment at the college will be up. That might be related to the parking issue. Who knows? But um, but sort of along the same lines, I was just going I wanted to ask uh, Representative Paolucci the capacity of this room. We can fit 40. 40. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 20, 40. And numbers are up. So hopefully I've made my point. Um, <laughs> hey, 
And, uh, and I also think it might be fun for like this parliament to do like a Red Sox thing, like some sort of bonding thing that we all like grow beers and stuff. <laughs> 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 I'll do it for all. I'll do it for all. You don't have to draw. You can ocean or be after you. Draw. You can draw around. I do have a trip planned, actually. Okay, with that, we move on to alumni representative Buckley. Guys, can we just take a moment and talk about how awesome the cafe downstairs looks. Yeah. And give oh, I have a round of applause to whoever is responsible for that. The couches are so fluffy, and the bar bench is awesome. We're going to have those in 307 yeah. next to my house. And also, can we also draw we'll attention to the dean? This might be the first time I have ever, and I've been here for four ish, years, <laughs> ever seen him not in a suit. Yeah, and that moment when your dean, your former dean, is following you on Twitter. Those include my remarks. Right, remarks, Mr. Speaker. Representative Miali. Um, I just wanted to make a little um announcement that I was sitting in the cafe the other day, and like I'm gonna agree, um, it looks amazing. Um. The chairs that are like individually sat, like you can like sit with like one or two people. There's no plugs near those chairs. So like if you want to go there and do homework, it's very hard to charge your laptop or an iPad or an iPhone or anything because there's no plugs near those chairs. Yes, President Um Last year there was a resolution passed and a project going on to get charging stations in the cafe. So we're working on that. I don't know if you remember the status of that. I don't know what's going to happen. I know Tyler was looking into it. They, uh, they were on the expensive side, a couple yeah. thousand dollars. Um, they place ads on them. There's information boards and things that we just put on it. The student government was looking into it. Once we got the cafe furniture in and things get up and running this semester, you guys want to buy it? Might, you, might see it, it you might see it by the end of this academic year because I know flooring is still being put in. That whole space is working. You also <laughs> said, okay. uh, it, it's not done. The cafe is not done. We have a there's a floor. We're changing the floor to look similar to the dining center. And there may be some furniture rearranging too. So, you know, what's not. Okay. Look at that. You notice the, the uh, computers aren't hooked up yet. Yeah. They they will be. Okay. Wow. Well, that, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative, easy. Uh, on the cafe, there's just one downside that I'd like to add, and someone brought up to me the other day. If there is someone who is in fact handicapped and needs to get to the elevator from, let's say the back down there. The new chairs that they got, while being awesome and fluffy and all the good stuff, they do hinder um, they do hinder someone who's handicapped or in a wheelchair or just has a hard time walking to get into the elevator. Um, maybe if we can try, you know, feng shui a little bit better down there to actually accommodate the handicapped, it would be a very good thing. And that's all I have to say. Representative Goldberg. I motion to adjourn. All right, we're second. To the table. Oh, oh, second. Second from Representative Allen. All right. Discussion. Go to a vote. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 All, all opposed, please say no. 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 Let the record show that after the rose votes no. Any abstentions? All right. Well, you know, guys, be quiet during the uh, adjournment. So, Ms. Tua, if you please do the roll call. And with that, we are adjourned. Please be quiet.